Welcome. We're going to go into Rule 7 tonight. Envision God's enveloping presence. And um, let's open in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us tonight. We pray that you'll be with us as we study your word, to challenge us afresh and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And uh, our one lady is away today, and then my wife is not feeling well, so she picked up some kind of a bug when she traveled. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. so, but she is, <coughs> we are, we have an extra, we are vaccinated against COVID, and she's had COVID before, so it's just be a cold. All right, I'm just going to turn to. Rule 7, envision God's enveloping prison. What's wrong? Brainless. Are you breaking things again? <laughs> so we have looked at six of the Red Sea rules already, and tonight we're looking at God's presence in the trial. Um, or else the rule says, envision God's enveloping presence. And it's based on Exodus 14, verse 19 to 20. The angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. I wrote down here that that was an awesome display of power and <laughs> yes, and uh, differences between, you know, probably good and evil too. Yes, it it very much so. Um, it speaks also about God's relationship to people that are saved and people that have rejected Him. The light and the darkness. So it definitely. Um, there's an interesting point here if you think of that. As we look at that uh, Exodus there, up to this point, God was getting the Israelites to accept Him, to accept that He knew what He was doing, that He had a way. Only once they were accepted and they were ready to take the next step from last week, take the next logical step, then he can move from in front of leading them to the back of protecting them. So, before that, he wasn't, he, had, he needed to lead. Once I accepted his guidance and his leading, he could move to protect. He still was leading from behind, but, but not that prominent place that he had. So, like the ones who depended on him to yes. take a move forward. So, let's have a look at this. In a conversation with a man defending his reason for not becoming a Christian, he said, at work I've watched people going through tough times. Some are Christians, some are not. They all act the same. I expect Christians to respond differently to the problems of life. Isn't God supposed to be with them? Now, we could debate the accuracy of his observation. Sometimes, of course, people perhaps look for miracles in Christians which are not there. However, they should see some type of difference, whether, we, whether he is 100% accurate in his statement or not. There is an important truth. I expect Christians to respond differently to the problems of life. Isn't God supposed to be with them? Somebody once said that non-believers don't read the Bible. The only Bible they read is your life in front of them. Mm. That's quite a challenge. How would you, if you think of his statement, and if you look at there, what do you think are expected similarities between Christians and non-Christians' reactions to life trials? As they face the trials in life, um, what would you expect 
some similarities to bear. Let's, let's say you lose a loved one. Both would mourn, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. Because we're human and it's natural to mourn. Mm-hmm. Jesus wept when he saw the pain of the Lazarus' death. Mm-hmm. He showed that mourning. He not only mourned for Lazarus, who he was going to bring back to life again, but he mourned for the pain he saw in those that loved him and were around him. Mm-hmm. So, what other similarities might there be between Christians and non-Christians when we face trials? All those emotions, fear and everything. We're really human. Yeah. Yeah. We're human after all. Yeah. But what describe expected similarities between Christians and non-Christians' reactions to life trials, we said. And let's take the next one. What, what are some differences that you, between Christians and non-Christians when they refer to life trials? Should be a Christian would face trials with peace and certainty and strength and calmness. Should be. I can only speak for myself. I should. Okay. I yeah. try, but I fail most of the time. What about pray? And stopping to pray. You see, that's, I had a problem with it the last time. Because even though some Christians are Christians, they may not be fully Christians. They might not like pray and really believe. Right. But then there are non-Christians that they pray and they believe that God is with them. But some people don't expose you know, their prayer and things like that. They do kind of study. So it's kind of like it depends on the non-Christian and the Christian as we see a Christian. Because some people are non-Christian but they have their own way of expressing themselves and their own belief. Mm-hmm. So, even though they might not believe in our God, they are taking the time to do whatever it needs to be done to praise whoever they praise. And some of us Christians don't do that. We go to church and we act the role and do the routine, but that doesn't necessarily make us true Christians. Mm-hmm. So that's why I had a problem okay. with the lesson because... I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I just say non and Christians, but there's there's variables in both simil- you know, mm-hmm. non-Christians and Christians. Um, I would say in that example you gave there, they might be praying to some other higher power that they perceive, but I don't believe they can find the peace that Christians can find when they pray to God. Because in the other so-called higher powers, there is no peace because there is no God. It, it, it's a false belief. But at the same time, you agree with you, you can't help admiring them to, you know, they work hard at it. Let's, let's take a person, and, and we, I'm, I'm moving slightly off, but let's take a person that's heavily involved in a cult that we don't recognize as a Christian church. And they learn they have to work for their salvation. And they work hard and they go door to door and, they, you know, um, mm. I admire that hard work. I admire the door to door. And as Christians, we got a lot to learn from that. We should be going and we should be reaching out. But in itself, it's not, our, it's not by works that we're saved. It's by faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So, I would think the difference here between the two would be genuine peace. Um, Where I remember just after we came to America, there was a a girl from California that had gone to South Africa on a visit, and I can't remember her name, but she was killed by some young black guys in a township in South Africa. She was murdered. And the parents, they were Christian, they went to South Africa and reached out to these young black black men and showed them love. Now that is something you can't just... It's something deep from the Holy Spirit that has to be there that you can actually love the person that's taken your loved one away. Um, So I think there are definite signs that as Christians should be there, first of all, that we pray. Secondly, um, is peace. 
and being able to talk through it and let others talk. There's a young guy that works with me. Um, he shared that he's one of four brothers and three of them have committed suicide. And man, it was hard. So I said, he hasn't got a father around either anymore. I said to him the other day, I said, um, you know that you've got a lot to live for. He says he knows it. And I said, I want you to know any time you have somebody that you need to talk to, I'm available for you. That's all. I haven't spoke to him about Christianity because I can't do that at work. But I've given, opened the door for him to talk to me and, he, and his words to me, because I was just leaving for the night and he had to go out to do something. He said, when we meet again, I need to get your telephone number from you. So there was interest. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think? So taking what you said and what you perceive, what would you think you expect, besides what I've said, expect to see differences between Christian and non-Christian when it comes well, to trials? I'll give you a bit of an example. Monday I had a client and they came and they decided they were going to buy us pizza and eat with us. And so they were already started eating and I told them, I said, well, we always pray. So they do my hands and stop eating. And today I took her to Social Security to provide the documents. And on the way up there she said, what is the difference? Which, no, what church are you going to? And I told her. And they said, well, what are you guys doing in that church? And I, you know, I told them basically what, what our belief was. <coughs> And then she was kind of like puzzled, and she said, but I said, we all believe in, in God, because she's Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so oh, she was fine, but then on the way back, without me saying anything, she says, but you guys don't believe in saints, right? And I told her, I said, no, we don't believe in the images. She said, well, St. Jude, which is one of their top saints. For healing, isn't it? Yeah, he was an apostle. That's St. That's, Jude mm -hmm. was an apostle, and that's who they supposedly are praying to St. Jude's prayer intervention. But she couldn't understand why we not believe that. And I didn't want to go further without any knowledge because I didn't want to say yes. something that wasn't correct. So I thought, you know, you want to speak more of it, you're welcome to come to the house. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we can a, say the wrong thing without meaning no. As a Christian, we are all <laughs> saints. Yeah, but see, the thing that she wasn't looking at, she was looking at, why don't we pray to St. Yes. Mm -hmm. and why don't we pray to the Virgin? And, and the, I mean, the scripture says there's no way to come into God, but through me, Jesus mm -hmm. said, she is the only way. Um, they are, I agree with you, though, um, I lost a good friend. He was in the Church of the Nazarene, but he grew up Catholic, and he decided to go back to the Catholic Church, and I tried my best to persuade him other. But by telling him what I thought was wrong with the church and the uh, with the Catholic Church, I lost him as a friend. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. why I didn't want to do. It. I didn't want to. You know, God wants me to guide her somehow. I didn't want to. But if you look at somebody <coughs> like Mother Teresa, I I can never say that that woman was not saved. Mm -hmm. She did more in her life to exemplify Christ and being Christ-like and living mm -hmm. like Christ than anybody else I know. And we might disagree theologically with some of these groups. Uh, uh, the cults are definite where they go away from the Bible. We do the, um, There's going to be Catholics in heaven. There's going to be Protestants in heaven. There's going to be people in heaven you would be surprised to see. But God is going to judge each person according to the light they've received and what they did with it. Next year. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just glad that's going to be a just God that's going to judge one day and not people like you and me. Mm -hmm. I'll get it wrong every time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to say anything because I was brought up Catholic. I was yeah. going to be a nun and I, you know, I got married. But then I was later on in life, I was baptized in the Baptist church. And then a few years, like 20, well, how many years? Six, five, six, I don't know, we've been coming to the Nazarene church. So I'm versed in all areas, but sometimes even then, at least there's biases, and so sometimes it's better to step back and wait to talk to someone who knows more than, yes. <laughs> than I. Well, I was baptized in the Baptist Church as well, so we were in good company. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I actually got saved in the Baptist Church and then went over to the Nazarene Church. Okay.
As we continue our journey through our Red Sea, one marked difference should manifest as we apply Rule 7. Envision God's enveloping presence. In the book tonight, and um, I just want to see here, uh, there was... Thought, um, uh, the author said, one of my daughters told me she sometimes goes to sleep visualizing the Lord holding her in his arms as I held her in the rocking chair when she was small. Mm-hmm. She visualizes God holding her. Um, there's another person that believed that as he prayed, he would look at a chair next to him. He'd put another chair there and he visualized God sitting in a chair and you would talk to him like you're talking to a friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's different ways of doing it. The whole idea is that God becomes so so real to us that we visualize his presence with us in the room. We know he's always with us. Mm -hmm. But to, to, to take it to that step, and I don't think I've ever visualized as such that, um, but I felt his presence. There's times definitely that you can feel God's presence with you. Um, But some people take it further and they actually visualize. And what this rule is saying is the more we sense God with us, the easier it is to trust in Him and to walk with Him by our side as a friend. It's kind of like putting ourselves on, like say for instance, Roger, I don't know much about him, but the more I spend time with Roger and, and spend more, you know, listening to him, being with him, I can become more oriented to him and lose sight of myself. So I think that's what God wants us to. The more we focus on him, we lose sight of ourselves and what's around us. Yes. Okay, let's look at some scriptures. And I think the scriptures were in the chapter. Yeah. Yeah, there's a scripture, and I think we're going to find the same scriptures that were in the. the so Exodus 19, uh, 14 verse 19 to 20. Where did I have that? But that was in the front of the book, I think. That's the one you read. Yes. 14, 19, 20. It was the one I read, and I, I, sorry. I've lost my place. Can can you? It's my fault. (laughs) No, you got it. No, I'm lost where Uh, I found the scripture. 19 to 20. Yes. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to to these, so that the one came not near the other all that night. The scripture's on the very first page where Mm -hmm. it says Red Sea Rule 7. I found it afterwards. So on your book where it says Red Sea Rule 7, that scripture is printed underneath as well. I thought I'd seen it somewhere and I was trying to... Fine, thank you. Mm-hmm. So, if you look at red, how could we change the writing of this um, to, to, to be more understandable? And I actually was looking, I have a Bible at home that's got multiple versions in one, and I could not find it today. And, um, of course, I couldn't find it. But um, it says, the angel of God, as you read, who went before, for the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to one and it was light by night to the other. We could strand it and say that God went from leading the group, as we said earlier, to protecting the group. It went from leading in front to protecting behind. At the same time as protecting them, he provided light for those in front and darkness for those behind. That's another way of 
paraphrased in that scripture. And because the Egyptians were in sight of the Israelites and they could have attacked that night and wiped them out. But God confused them. And only when the Israelites were in that water and moving did he open up for the Egyptians, you know, where they were at a safe distance that he let the Egyptians start moving. But he kept them in confusion and in darkness. So that's how I would rephrase that. He has uh, a confused face over there. <laughs> no, I'm I, I, I'm trying to imagine this in my in my mind what it looks like. It's it has to be. Uh, it it is so awesome. It's it's almost hard to imagine these waters parting. This pillar. This that must. It, it's just beyond description. The darkness I can understand related to the cloud. When I think of some of the thunderstorms I saw in Ohio, where we'd be sitting in the office in the daytime and this light is coming in from outside, and suddenly it goes pitch black outside, mm -hmm. and the lights, it's like night, and the lights are shining in, but it's dark outside, and it's just a storm cloud coming over that makes it dark. And it's crazy, you just can't believe how dark it can get. When we travel, when he takes me to Michigan, there's green clouds in the sky, but one side is real dark. And as we pass him, and I look behind, because I always look behind you see, and there's hope bright on the other side. Yes. It's, it's really, you know, when I read this, it reminds me of the time so he's taking me to Michigan, and I see that the difference in the clouds from one side to the other. And do you realize how high that cloud can go? I was in, at the airport in Chicago, um, on my way back to California after working a week in the project and we couldn't, we were held, our plans were delayed because of terrible thunderstorms in the area. When they eventually let us go, we flew up and we went, went up into these clouds and it's something I'll never forget, we were flying in a canyon of cloud. There were two walls on either side and the plane was like an insect next to it. We were dwarfed by this walls of cloud now. And it was a canyon. It wasn't a straight path through. It was a canyon that we were flying in. I will never forget that. Yeah, but those anvils, some of those anvil clouds, thunderheads can get 45, 50, 60,000 feet in the air. Yes. <coughs> They're magnificent to look at. It, it's God's... Um, Nature, God's nature that He created is awesome and incredible and makes us feel very puny and small. Now, Rob used the term in this chapter um, where he spoke about a, a, another pastor that said that the angel of God yeah, could refer to Jesus Christ from a, another, and he quoted a scripture where. Um, Jesus is a pers uh, word? Personif personification, is that the right word? Where he reflects God. We see God through Jesus. And they were seeing God through the cloud. God's presence was there in the cloud mm -hmm. and in a pillar of fire. And that was actually God there, but it could also have been Jesus, because mm -hmm. in the Trinity, as you look at scriptures in the New Testament, Jesus, people see God through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that when they spoke of angel of God, it could even have been Jesus. Now, that can cause a whole um, theological debate. Um, I looked at... Um, at, at uh, commentary um, today and the commentary just said the angel of God it did not go into that and it was one of the well known commentaries so um, the main thing is how God's presence was there whether it was through an actual angels whether it was God himself or whether it was Jesus Christ it was God's presence that was shown to them but the difference for the Egyptians and the Israelites was enormous. To the Israelites, 
it was something that provided comfort, mm -hmm. it provided a, a sense of security, it provided light, it provided leadership, God's cloud. To the Egyptians, mm -hmm. it provided confusion, it provided fear, it provided darkness. Mm -hmm. It was a very big difference between the two groups. Look at page 43 of your notes. And I'm sorry to the group on the, uh, that look on camera that you don't have study notes with you. Um, if you ever want to go through this yourself and you want to get your study notes, there's a study guide that's been um, produced, the Red Sea Rules Study Guide. And you can buy this online, and it's very good when going through the actual book. And mm -hmm. these are the way I get the, no the notes from. So I encourage you, the Red Sea Rule Study Guide. Page, let's just see here. Let's just see. God, uh, God surrounds his people with favor. I'm sorry, I just lost it. As with a shield, Psalm 5.12 uh, backs us up there. Eh? God sur surrounds his people with songs of, of deliverance. Mercy surrounds those that trust in the Lord. 32 verse 7 and 10 says we pray along with the psalmist Lord let your constant love surround us for our hopes are in you alone at the Red Sea God put his people in a position where his presence had never been so real to them using difficulty he cultivated within them a greater appreciation for himself <laughs> God's presence in the trial is much better than exemption from the trial <laughs> that that is is quite a statement how many times that, as Christians do we ask God to remove the trial from us Jesus said if, if possible but not my will but thy will when he spoke about the trial he was going to face on the cross but God's trial brings us closer to him and it's actually much better than being exempt from the trial. Mm -hmm. We grow. And I know in my life where I first read see that I have definitely been the closest to God. When I left California to go and work in Ohio, I was out without a job for 10 months and I went through a bankruptcy. And it was, it was tough, and, but I had, I've never... I, I have it before, but I think that is the closest I felt God's presence was that time hmm. before I got that job at, at Ohio. Because when, the more you, the more problems you have, the more we rely on God, the more we are open to Him and reaching out to Him. And in some cases it even allows more time. It's not always the case, but in that case it did. But um, but when we are things are going well and we are busy we tend to forget about god mm -hmm. that's why i pray every day in the kills yes because if i lose sight of prayer that you know i have to learn to be thankful and and the good the better and the ugly that's why I make it a point to pray. and that's why we do as the bible says we go daily into your closet and you know do a quiet time with god and make it twice a day if you can I, I'm, you know whatever works Okay, let's look at prepare for the journey on your study mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at the uh, scriptures and that. I believe they had them here. Where did I see them? No. Yeah. No. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't study too much today. I saw it, yeah, yeah, they are. I didn't do the all day. All That's week. fine. So, Psalm 512. I'm going to read these for you. God surrounds his people with songs of deliverance, 
Mercy surrounds those who trust in... Oh no, I've got the wrong time, sorry. Psalm 5.12, God surrounds his people with favour as with a shield. God surrounds his people with favour. Psalm 5.12. These are good scriptures. It's to write in the front of your Bible. Yeah, I know where it's at, but I can find it. It's here. Oh, you're reading in there. I, I can't give you the page number in your book because I'm, I've got Brenda's oh, book and it's got slight, slightly different. I'm on 72. Oh, yeah. Psalm 32 verse 7 says, God surrounds his people with songs of deliverance. Mercy surrounds those who trust in the Lord. The first one said it's a shield. The second one said songs of deliverance. Mercy surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Psalm 32 verse 10. That was 7 and 10. That was 7 and 10. I wrote, I read both together there. Sorry. So 7 was, I got confused for a moment. Thank you. The 7 was mercy surrounds, no, 7 was his people, he surrounds his people with songs of deliverance. Mm -hmm. Ten was, mercy surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Psalm 33 verse 22. We pray along with the psalmist. Lord, let your constant love surround us. For our hopes are in you alone. Constant love. 33, that was 22. One twenty Isaiah one twenty no not Isaiah one twenty five verse two I got it just somewhere. No oh, way, do. Thank you. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about His people from henceforth, even forever. Yeah. And it was on the previous page of my book. Sorry. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, and I was thinking of Jerusalem in the valley and the mountains surrounding it. So the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Think of the, the Israelites at that moment. They were facing the Red Sea in front, mountains on either side and the Egyptians behind. And as they were surrounded by impossible odds, and they look at the scripture, it says, but like you surround, it could almost say, not just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, but as you surrounded by impossible odds, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Isn't that a great promise? Psalm 139 verse 5 says, I look behind, 5 and 6 by the way, I look behind me and you're there. Then up ahead and you there too. Your reassuring presence come in and go in. This is too much, too wonderful, I can't take it all in. God says, He is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's with us yesterday, today and forever. He's prepared for yesterday, today and forever. And He knows what's coming. He knows what's gone on before. He knows what's happening in the present. There's no surprises to God. There's surprises to us, yes, but not to God. He, we're going to see in, as, as we look in on in a couple of the new uh, the, um, promises that are left we're going to look at that God knows what trials we're going to be facing but I look behind me and you're there I look up ahead and you're there too your assuring presence come in and go in. it's interesting the psalmist probably didn't mention I'm, I'm, that you're with me right now he's saying behind you there and up ahead you're there he didn't say anything about where he was at the moment, perhaps it's because he knew God was with him and he was walking already, but he could see him in the future and he could see him behind him as well as he looked back. It's like that poem when they speak about the footprints in the sand and it shows that two lots of footprints and then it becomes one and then it, um, God says this is, uh, the person asked, God says this is my footprints as I walk with you in life and said, well what happens where there's only one lot of, of footprints 
this was through a difficult time in my life. Did, did you leave me then? He said, no, I was carrying you. Yes. I was carrying you through that. Um, that little prayer, that little thing to save me through trials and tribulations when I was young. Someone gave it to me. It was sport and we kept on. I yes. Kept on. <laughs> and I've shared it too. <laughs> so, through the ages, where has God manifested his presence? Difficult times. I'm just looking what we could yeah. Sorry. Just bear with me as I find myself. I was hoping that I could find that song. Okay, Exodus 40, 34 to 35. Somebody can... Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God has manifested His presence in the tabernacle to the, uh, His children. Um, not only did they, did they, they did it, um, it become a symbol of God's presence because God didn't walk with them as he walks with us today they did not have God's presence in their hearts as we do so the tabernacle was the symbol of God's presence but to the priests and the leaders in the tabernacle he revealed his presence sometimes by his glory and very much the uh, Ark of the Covenant was also a, a symbol of what God um, if you remember a writer in the one time when somebody put out his hand to steady the mm -hmm. ark, he died because mm he's -hmm. not allowed to touch the ark. That seems a bit harsh sometimes when you think of that, but um, but yes. <laughs> 1 Kings 8, 10 to 11. There's another place that he exemplified it. Let me find my Bible in here. Yeah. One Kings eight ten to eleven. Well, somebody looks it up. I'm going to look up the next one, John one fourteen. One Kings eight. What were the verses on? One Kings eight, I think, was eight to eleven. Ten and eleven. Ten to eleven. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Okay. There again, God's presence was manifested. And again, it was the priests that... that it was manifested to the leaders of the day. Um, 14, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, I'm battling with the online Bible. John 14, can somebody get that for me? Get this Bible out, it's going to be easier. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, this is one of the most, throughout the ages it says how has God manifested his presence to his people. In the Old Testament it was through the tabernacle and through the priests. Mm -hmm. 1 John was the start of a new um, dimension of God with his people. Where Christianity was introduced. And in that it came through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The Word was God. It was manifested through Jesus, the Word, that His presence. Ephesians 2.19 You 
you get it before me, you're welcome to read it. But I've got it. 219. Oh, I'm taking second place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 219 says... Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, yes. but fellow citizens and with the saints, and of the household of God. Now, an interesting, this, from my version of this Bible, it says now, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. Because this portion of scripture, Paul, they, they, Paul was addressing the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It's just a, as a matter of interest, but it's for all Christians now. Because when, the, when Christianity was open to the Gentiles, what was originally just for the Jews was given to us. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Because it, when Jesus manifested himself to the Jews, they rejected him. And because that, they opened it to everybody. There were cases in the Old Testament where they did allow non Jewish people to become part of the Jewish nation. Um, is a proselyte, I think. Um, <coughs> and there are certain rituals they had to go through. And if they tried then, when God opened it, and when he, uh, he said to, he gave Peter that vision of, of um, uh, he said somebody's knocking at your door. Well, he first gave him the vision of all these different types of animals coming down in a sheet. And they were all kinds of animals a Jew was not allowed to eat. They were unclean. And he said to Peter, eat. Peter said, I can't. He said, don't, want, I don't call what I've called clean, unclean. Mm -hmm. And then he said to Peter, you've got people at your door coming to you. They want to hear about Christianity, me. He said, go and talk to them. And he was opening the, the door for them. Um... What do these following verses teach us about the presence of God in our lives? Matthew 28, 20. 28, 20. Matthew, yeah, Matthew. I, Matthew. I NIV, mm -hmm. Yeah. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So. This, I think, was part of the Great Commandment, wasn't it? Great Commission, yes. Great Commission, go into all the world. Mm -hmm. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, yes. baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them this word. Yes, so that was the last part of it that says, teaching them, and I am with you always. What a promise to us about the presence of God in our lives. <clears throat> Not just when it suits Him. Not when we meet certain criteria, not when we've been good, not when we say our prayers, not when we pay our tithes, all these things we should be doing, but He's with us always. John 14, 18 to 21. John 14. 18 to 21? Yes. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am the, in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Isn't that a great promise? Not to, only do we live with the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives now, but we look forward to the day when we, I think of that song, there shall, there shall be a, about a meeting in the air, in the sweet by and by, Oh, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember the words to it all, but we think about the banquet that's going to be in the sky as we meet together. It, it's going to be so exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I have 1 Corinthians 6, 19, yeah, I'll take it. Um, chapter 4, 19, 6, 19, I've got it, yeah. Bear with me, I have got it. Being circumcised or uncircumcised, no, this is 8. Sorry, I'll get there. <laughs> 619, you surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit is in you and is a gift from God. You are no longer on your own. What does that say about God's presence with us? It's with us all the time. Right in us. And we have the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and also prompt us when we go off course and and. and Say, you need to step right again. Convict us. John 11.32. Somebody got that? Oh, yes. Jesus answered them. Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? So, Sorry, what was the last sentence there? So, uh, that, I've shown you, and then since what are those works? <laughs> got, I'm sorry. i got to go back to it. i got to find it in 32. For which of those works do you stone me? Okay. So, this was during the time where Jesus was um, doing miracles and that, and people were drawn but at the same time they didn't like it when he spoke directly out and criticized the Pharisees and there was one point where they actually lifted up stones and Jesus said that and then he just walked right through them and they didn't touch him. Um, on the next page Yes, it is. Oh no, sorry. First, go back to the previous page. According to John eleven thirty two. Now, I think we've got a different. I think we had the wrong verse there. No, this is eleven thirty two. Yes. No, I wrote the wrong. I, I, then when Mary was come where you. Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at down at his feet, saying unto him. Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother would not have died. Mm -hmm. What was she speaking about? Lazarus. Lazarus. That was where Jesus went. He saw their hurt and, and their confusion and he wept for them. Mm -hmm. um, what impact did Mary believe Jesus' presence would have had in a family's crisis? It would have been avoided. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have died. She believed that Lazarus might not have died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that things will not go right and that, that, that trials will be removed from us? In some cases, we're still going to lose a loved one no matter how hard mm -hmm. we pray. But God's presence is with us and with the, the, the people around Him. It would have made... It was harder for Mary and them to accept Lazarus' loss with the, the seemingly... They had got a message to Jesus early enough that he could have been there before Lazarus died, and he didn't come. Mm -hmm. To Mary, it was more that uh, it was more that Jesus had let them down, and he didn't care. And sometimes, as Christians, we feel that when we go into a trial, it's almost, Lord, how could you have let this happen to me? I think of Lot. I, I couldn't. I couldn't even begin to imagine what he went through with losing his family and everything. And he was serving God. He was doing everything right. When and I read that, to me, it was a test of faith. But yeah, I perceived it as a test of faith. Yes. It was a test of faith because the devil said Lot would turn on him if he lost everything. It's only because everything's going well. And, and, and God knew Lot because God and him had a relationship. And he said, I know it won't happen, but he had to put Lot through that trial to, to prove it. All right, the next page. 59. 45. 45, sorry. Me and my pages. 
how would having Jesus right beside you affect your response to the challenges in your life? If Jesus was right beside me, I don't think I would have any challenges. <laughs> Everything would be just ideal. How would having Jesus right There's beside you affect your response to this? There shouldn't be any change because we, you, 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 God should be there with you. You should always feel that God is with you. Correct, and that, that is the whole purpose of tonight's rule, number seven, envisioning the presence mm -hmm. of God. To us, we should, it, we should be envision that God is with us all the time. And as you said, you know, that we, as we of course, it's then not quite accurate what you said because even though he's there and he's with us and he's right beside us in the vision, we still face the trials. Correct? Correct. And, and Job, not Job, um, yes, Job, um, he was serving God and he had an incredible relationship with God. And he went through a trial that I don't know even how many of us could ever face. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he said, his wife even said to him eventually, curse God and mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. And he said no. He trusted his God too much to give in. That yeah. relationship was so deep with him and God. Sorry. No, that's okay. You're the teacher. I was just going to say, I've gone through so many trials, including abuse in my life, and I, I prayed through them. And some people that have probably gone through what I went through, they would still be lost in the situation. And because of prayer, the challenge became a challenge. I passed through it, and then another one came along. But I was put God in whatever the challenge was. No matter how fearful or scary it was, but somehow they were not, like, they didn't make an impact as far as the pain and the emotion and, and not trusting God. And some people, I know that they do sight of God and trust in, in Him because of the challenges they go through in their life. Yeah. It's the great thing about ooh, we're running out of time. The great thing about working through challenges like this and having the experiences, it helps us to help others that are going through the same problems mm -hmm. and be able to. If somebody loses a grandchild and somebody else has lost a grandchild and God has helped them through it, I'm just mentioning that that person come side by side with that person and help them through their situation and love them through the situation. We have so many things that God helps us and as a body of Christ we're there to help each other. Um, in light of Rule 7, I'm just going to wrap it up here, I'm sorry. You were having such a good time. <laughs> <laughs> How will this thinking of Rule 7 envisioning God's presence with us how will that change your step as you take steps forward in facing your Etsy's? I, when I pray, I envision myself talking to God. It's not just a, a voice going out. I, mm -hmm. I envision myself talking to God. They say take it a step further and you actually envision God sitting in front of you. But it, it's just sensing that present. And the more you do it, the more it will be like having God by your side. And it will eventually get to a point where God's with you all the time and you just don't lose him there. It's not just when you pray. You sense him there all the time. I think that's where they're going with this. Mm -hmm. Is to build a stronger sense of his presence with mm -hmm. us as, as, mm -hmm. as we move forward. And at... And thinking of that, as, as we face our Red Seas, the closer we are to God, the easier it is to trust in Him. Job's faith was incredible with what he went through. Do yourself a favor, sometimes read through the book of Job again, and see how strong his faith was in God. And at the worst, at the worst, he, he, God was there for him. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and evermore. What a promise to us. We sometimes go through tests and trials of life and sometimes we feel so alone. 
but we can see that God is indeed near us, that we can't go anywhere outside of his presence. And we need to ask him to help us sense his nearness. And as long as he's near, what do I have to fear? Mm -hmm. The more you sense his nearness, the less fear you will have in life. I'll just never forget when Job's wife said to him, because God and I. He said, no. Besides what he went through. Let's pray as we close our scripture tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence and Lord, help us to, to, to envision your presence. We think of families that have lost a loved one and sometimes go through that period where they leave an empty chair at the table for the loved one's stall, as if the loved one was with them. Lord, your servant is teaching us here that we need to do that with your presence, that in every situation, Every meeting we're in, when we drive in the car, when we sit at the dinner table, when we talk to friends, that you are with us and that we can sense your presence with us. And Lord, we realize that could change our lives in so many ways that there wouldn't just be idle chit chat and that we'd be aware of, of it all the time. And when we're aware of you, we can help others so much more in reaching out to them. I pray about this young guy at my work, Lord, that's gone through so much as a 19-year-old teenager and seen three of his brothers commit suicide, lost his father. And I pray, Lord, that you'll open a door for him, you to speak through me to him and, and reach out to him. And I pray in our own lives, not only that as we apply this to our lives and as we visualize your presence with us, how it will help us through our problems, but that through that we can reach out to those around us and that you will speak to them through our lives. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'll say goodbye because... He doesn't get turned off until I say goodbye. <laughs> and I'm in trouble again. <laughs> yes, thank you.